Well, it has been often debated, is India prepared for a two-front war challenge? And to discuss that and a lot more about India's preparedness, several narratives, and of course, how defense modernization is shaping a new India, is with me, General Vinod Khandare, uh, who has been, of course, in the past uh, for 40 years with the Indian Army in different significant roles, including uh, the Chief of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Deputy Chief of the Integrated Defense Staff and the Military Secretary of the National Security Council as is currently the military advisor of the Ministry of Defense. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I want to begin by asking you a very simple and straight question. Is India prepared for a two-front war challenge? And what if there is such an eventuality uh, with the defense of India, with the kind of ammunition we have, the technology that we have, are we capable to handle such a situation? Aditya, we are definitely ready for the two-front war. How to handle it is a different issue. Do we engage both our adversaries with the same intensity or do we hold one and we deal with the another one? You know, these are ways and means of military planners, their brilliance of how to handle the situation so that the emergency does not cascade into a disaster on both the fronts. You know, when we look at similar situation scenarios, it is the genius of the military planner and the person who executes it, how to deal with both. Do we open up both fronts with the same uh, level? No. So we have a method of dealing with it. You raised a very pertinent point about technology and the military inventory. You know, military inventory, the first level resides with the military formations. And the second reserve, is with the factories. So here the nation comes into play where the ordnance factories, the private sector, the DPSUs, they all have to pitch in and increase the production to a level which is called the surge capacity. So what we hold and what we can pump in are two different things and both put together cumulatively give us the logistic stamina. So this is as regards the adequacy <clears throat> when it comes to technology, what technology we have and what technology we will need, we master the technology that we have. At that last moment, I don't think we are in a position to bring in new technology. So we will have to do with what we have. And that is exactly where the man behind the machine or man in the machine will be of use. You know of the past cases when uh, we had inferior uh, inventory, uh, take uh, 65, take 71, but we emerged victors because of the man behind the machine. So I think finally it will be a combination of what we have, how much we have and who is the one operating it. Uh, if I can take it forward, the kind of challenge that we face from China and we understand that China has uh, been habitual of having these tendencies of expansionist tendencies, you know, so as to say. Uh, you know, we saw what happened in Galwan and it's been a few years ever since. And India's also brought in a paradigm shift towards its China policy, militarily and diplomatically. Where do we stand today vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, militarily speaking? Uh, we have pumped in a lot of resources uh, in the Northern Command, in, of course, uh, the 14 Corps. But as of now, uh, of course, talks are underway both at the military level and at the level of uh, the diplomats. But is there a headway or do you predict a similar incursions in the future as well uh, because the CCP hasn't really changed its uh, modus operandi when it comes to India. CCP has not changed, CCP is not going to change. CCP is the main organ, whether you call it the deep state, whether you call it the a lot of people who run China. Uh, CCP owns the army, CCP owns the nation. So whatever is going to be decided by CCP, and if CCP was, was to decide, the border issue would have been resolved. It is very evident that CCP does not want the border issue to be resolved so that they can rally the people behind it and show India as one of the troublesome neighbors and uh, ensure that if there is any fomenting of trouble inside, they can divert it towards the southern neighbor. So that, that is how CCP's psyche is. I think one of the most important things for people like us is to be able to understand the psyche of the adversary. As of now, we see a constant there that is to play India 
as one of the troublesome neighbors. So I, I don't think uh, there is a resolution in sight. The talks that you mentioned, this is an ongoing thing. Uh, China never tires of talking. And China, this time you've seen, uh, has not uh, spent time on trying to deal with the diplomat diplomacy part. They have put the PLA in front. Uh, if PLA was the one who had to decide, I think long time back we should have been able to resolve this. I don't see it going uh, anywhere much. But from India's point of view, uh, do we act obstinate or stubborn and say that we are not going to talk militarily? No, we are open to talking to military leaders, we are open to talking to diplomats. So every possible option we will continue to use. So that's something that we should be very clear about that uh, it will continue. Galwan was followed by Yangtze. So such things will continue to happen. It is uh, the way we prepare ourselves for line of control against Pakistan is totally different from the way we deal with our preparations with China. So LAC is a t totally different ball game. So our troops who are uh, facing the northern borders know that it's a different challenge, know that the methodology is going to be different and the response of the nation also has to be in support of the military on the same terms. If I can now turn towards the other irritant, that is Pakistan. You've seen the internal turmoil that Pakistan is facing, but my question is different. It's about the kind of collapse and the collision that Imran Khan has had with the Pakistan army and Imran Khan has had with the coalition government as well. Is Imran Khan a problem child of the Pakistan army? And how do you predict the future? Do you see Imran Khan getting a second chance just like other prime ministers? Or do you think Pakistan army has made up its mind that there is no Imran Khan uh, in the future of Pakistan? You know, Aditya, in 2018, somewhere in the early years of 2018, one of the TV channels had interviewed me and the name of that program was Endgame Kashmir in which they had asked me similar questions related to equation or relationship Imran Khan would have with the Pakistan army. And I had said at that time, Pakistan army is okay with any politician who is subservient to Pakistan army and ISI, both put together. And the third angle you can add is the clerics. Now here one thing was clear that Imran Khan was getting fine with the clerics. He wasn't getting along fine with the Pak Army or the ISI, but Pak Army knew how to mold him and I think initial years of his being in chair, he was grateful to Pakistan Army and he was known as the selected Prime Minister. He was okay with that as long as Pakistan Army was hobnobbing with him and pampering him and giving him an image, a larger than life image, which Imran Khan is very fond of. Imran Khan as whatever his image has been for all these years likes to be at center stage, likes to be heard, likes to make himself believe that he is calling the shots. But the elephant in the room has always been ISA and Pak Army. So as long as they both were looking in the same direction, it was fine. But the moment uh, Imran Khan started challenging Pakistan Army, it was going nowhere. And we could uh, see it going nowhere. The amount of uh, animosity that got generated and how the behavior became vitriolic of Imran Khan against the Pak Army must have been a shock and a surprise for Pak Army itself. Where does this uh, go? You look at Pak Army whenever they have taken on any political leader of uh, Pakistan politics, they haven't spared that person, he or she. Either it is behind the bars or it is uh, going upwards. So I think uh, Imran Khan may have chosen the wrong enemy. Imran Khan initially tried to become a global Islamic leader and trying to bring in a new alliance. Uh, the Pak Army was okay with it, but the moment Saudis cracked the whip, Pak Army told Imran to shift. So I, I personally feel Imran Khan may have bitten a bit too much, more than what he can chew. And uh, finally, uh, the legislature, the judiciary, the executive, everything crawls when they are told to bend and Pakistan army is the one which finally calls the shots. If I can ask you, how do you see uh, Imran Khan became a very popular politician in Pakistan? Yes, he was a star cricketer. Uh, he has a massive, he had a massive fan following. 
but how did he become such a charismatic leader for the Pakistanis with, you know, for the first time outside his Zaman Park residence, we saw massive thousands of protesters uh, forcing the police and the security forces to retreat. Uh, is this a new Pakistan that we are witnessing or do you think that this is just a phase and how would you uh, term or characterize Imran Khan's personality? You know, Imran Khan is a personality uh, which a common Pakistani would love to see because they, they look at him as the playboy image, they look at him as somebody like a Greek god, the way he looks. And then I think he did a few things which appealed to the Pakistani conscience of starting a cancer hospital. And the way a Pakistani would love to see somebody giving an image to a Pakistani at the global level. I think that's what made him quite popular. Maybe Pakistan Army and ISI thought that this image would help to take this person from nowhere to a national leadership level. And they were quite confident that uh, when it came to a level where if he did not behave, uh, they would be able to snip him off. And I think that's exactly where the trouble started between the two. A poor Pakistani who is struggling to meet both ends meet. He is not in a position to do anything beyond just voicing some of these uh, remarks which Imran Khan has been giving to the people. So I think that part uh, Imran Khan used well, he used the media well, but that didn't go down well with the army and ISI. Is it a new era or is it a passing phase? To my mind, it's a passing phase. I don't think uh, such a thing will last long. I can correlate this with Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto had similar popularity up to a particular point and then suddenly he vanished from the scene and see what happened to him. A military leader who had no charisma, who had no fan following, was able to dispose him of. A similar thing was there with uh, Benazir also. So I think this is a passing phase and uh, the deep state in Pakistan is not too happy with such personalities. Nirankarnari, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you so much.